Have you ever been around someone who maybe is, is super into something that you're just kind of meh uh, about it? You, you can keep up with them for a while in their excitement, but, but after, after a little bit, you just, you just kind of, your, your intensity level or your, your into it level just starts to wane. And it's not that they're, they're wrong or that you're a bad person. It's just it's your levels, you just, you just don't match up. So, so at some point, you check out. Now, uh, a great example of this is uh, when a husband and wife go to maybe like a, a Home Depot or a, uh, or a paint store because you're going you're gonna to paint your, paint your house or paint a room, and, and, and you walk to the color wall, and I don't know if you've ever seen these things, but there's like 30,000 shades of every color on that wall. And some people are able to look at that and, and look at each shade and, and hold it up and, and compare it to others. And they'll spend what seems like hours and hours looking at all the, let's say, for example, all the blues. Now, see, for me, I'm good for about five minutes, and that's pushing it. And then they all start looking the same to me. I, I can't really see the difference between ocean blue and, and sea blue and island blue and sky blue and summer blue, blue and sunset blue. They're just, they're all blue. But my, my wife, she's different. She's different than me, and she likes to look she likes to compare. She likes to do all the things that you probably should do uh, when you're choosing a paint color. Because, and it's good that she does that because if it were up to me, our house would be Dallas Cowboys blue and our, our whole house would just be filled with large screen TVs. I mean, that, that, would be, that would be the decor. But the reason she's that way is because she cares about it. Really, she cares about it more than I do. Uh, she asks my opinion on things and, and I'll give it. Uh, to her, but at the end of the day, I'm okay with whatever she picks because 99% of the time, what she picks look good. It looks good, and, and honestly, it just really doesn't matter that much to me. Now, let's switch subject there. Let's start talking football, okay? Now, my wife is good for a few minutes. She'll ask questions of something maybe she doesn't understand, but she understands a lot about it. She grew up watching it. She'll watch games with me for a little while till she nods off for a nap, but after that, she's done. Why? Because she's not passionate about football, okay? Especially in, in any kind of sport that, that her kids aren't playing in it. If her kids aren't playing in it, she doesn't really want to watch it that well. She doesn't understand why I will sit and watch a whole game, and then after the game, for a whole other hour, watch highlights of the game that I just finished watching. She doesn't understand that. Uh, she doesn't understand why um, I, I get so upset when they lose, and, and it sort of just kind of ruins my week. Uh, when the cowboy, and you know, and I, as I'm saying this, I get it. I have problems. I know. She doesn't understand why, you know, I have three or four cowboy shirts, but I would like another three or four more. She doesn't get that. She doesn't enjoy hearing other grown men on sports radio talking about football um, like I do. Why? Does she hate football? No, not at all. But she's not passionate about it all, at it all. And, and do I hate paint samples? Yes, but, 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 but for my... For, for my point here, I'll just say, no, I don't. But here's the deal. I'm just not super into the whole decorating scene. Our passion levels are just different. We get excited about different things. And this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at an event in John where Jesus walks into a situation where everyone's focus, everyone's passion, everyone's uh, what's, what's important, it, it's, it's on a whole bunch of other stuff and and quite honestly, it's, it's all the wrong stuff. What should be the main thing is not the main thing. And Jesus' reaction to this is it's really quite strong. They're not passionate about what Jesus is passionate about. So we're going to read in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 19. <clears throat> Excuse me, it says this. The Jewish Passover, this is giving you some, some kind of a little bit of background on what's going on. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, okay, <laughs> nothing good's going to happen, okay, went right after that. So Jesus sees this, okay, so after making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling the doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. It's interesting. They see that and they, they think of this verse. So the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? In verse 19, Jesus answered, 
destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. So I think when, when someone, maybe if you're just reading this for the first time, or you're reading this for the first time in a long time, you might think, whoa, Jesus, looks like he's just gone nutso on, on, on everyone. What's the deal? Well, let's, let's get a little perspective here. The, so it's the time of Passover, and the Passover feast was one of the main feasts that the Jews celebrated on an annual basis. <clears throat> The Passover was a time for for the Jewish people to remember when God freed their ancestors from slavery and bondage from from under the the evil rule of the Egyptians. And there were plagues. If you you remember back into the story, there there were plagues that God had sent to the land of Egypt because Pharaoh was refusing to let the Israelites go. And as a matter of fact, the last plague was, was the death of all the firstborn in the land. All the firstborn in the land. So if you were a firstborn, this last plague, this, it doesn't matter if you were a newborn baby or if you were a, a 60-year-old. If you were the firstborn, all in the land, this, this was the last plague. And not just people, but, but animals as well. But God, through Moses, his, his servant Moses, he communicated to the Israelites And he told them that the angel of death would pass over your home. It would go by your home. You would be spared if they followed God's instructions and sprinkled the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. So when it came time for the plague, the Israelites were saved because they were under under the blood of the lamb. And and the author here, John, when he's writing, he records a lot of Jesus' ministry, a lot of the things that Jesus does. He records a lot of it around the Passover feast because I, I think for us, he he's wants to make the connection that Jesus is, he's the ultimate Passover lamb. Through the shedding of his blood on the cross, that's what we were all saved by. So, so this is the setting. And in Jesus' day, every, every adult male living within about five, 15 miles of Jerusalem, they're required to attend the Passover. And if, if he's over the age of 19, he also has to pay a temple tax. Now, many Jews, they would come from far, far away, and they would make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, at Passover to attend all the celebrations. And when, when uh, a, a Jewish person came to Jerusalem, the first place that they would always go to would be to the temple because they're going to pay their tax, and they're going to offer a sacrifice and worship to God. And so as a service to, the, as a service to people... There would be animals that would be sold um, so that you could buy these animals and use them for the sacrifice. People were traveling from long distances, and then it would just be easier for them to purchase an animal there um, and, and instead of maybe hauling one animal. And if you think about it, it's not just the family of four. Families traveled together. So if you were bringing your own animal, you were bringing several animals. And so if they were tra- it was just easier for them to, to buy one there. And there would also be, you made mention of, or there was the mention of the money changers. And so in the land where where these people lived, there was lots of different currency. And so, uh, and the currency, just like today, there would be faces of their leaders, faces of their rulers of their land on the coins. And so a coin that had the faith, the faith, the face of Caesar, okay, the leader of the Roman emperor, the the oppressive Roman emperor, they would have a a face of his, gosh, I can't even speak this morning. Let me rewind. There would be his face on the coin. And that coin with the face of Caesar on it would not be acceptable in the Jewish temple. So what there would be is that there would be money changers to say, to take your, your Roman coin and let me exchange it for a coin that would be acceptable for the, for the tax to be paid. Well, somewhere along the way, through all of this, the temple leadership figured out, hey, we, could, we, can, make, we can make some money from this. We can profit from this. So here's what we'll do is we'll let you guys sell your stuff in the temple. And what you can do is you can mark it up a little bit and you can make a profit and then we can also make a profit on top of that. And the money changers would do the same thing. that They would exchange the money at a higher rate uh, and, and so that everyone was profiting off of that. The vendors, the money changers, and, and the temple. Uh, one pastor, uh, Todd Wagner from Watermark, he, he referred to these guys as the temple mafia. So this is what's going on. And it got so bad that sometimes people would bring their own animals. They would bring their own animals to the temple, and then they would be inspected by the temple leadership and say, listen, that, that animal that you brought, that, it's that sacrifice, it's defective. But we have one here that we'll sell to you. So if you give us your defective animal plus a little extra, then we'll give you this animal that's suitable for sacrifice. Now that's bad, but here's where it gets worse. Then they would take that animal that, they just, that someone just traded in and they, that wasn't suitable for sacrifice, and then they would sell that animal to someone else as a suitable sacrifice. 
So there's, a, there's, <laughs> there's like a lot of Godfather going on here. It's, it, it's kind of crazy. But that's what's happening. That's what's going on when Jesus walks up to the scene. But here's the deal. As bad as that was, the even bigger deal is where this was all going down. See, it's happening inside the temple. This is God's house. Jesus calls it in there. He calls it, this is my Father's house. This is a place of worship. This is a place to encounter God. God was not confined to the temple structure, but what it signified was God's presence with his people. So people would come to worship him, and sacrifices were offered to him here in the temple. But one, com- one commentary said it like this. This, was, this house was built to display his glory, but the sounds of confession have been replaced with the sounds of commerce. Gone are silent prayers to God. They've been exchanged for the angry chorus of men haggling over the price of bulls and sheep. The cooing of doves and the stink of manure now occupy the place that used to be reserved for men to humble themselves and worship their God. So Jesus sees this, and, and we read what his, what his initial reaction was. He starts to make a whip. I mean, he doesn't start screaming. He doesn't start yelling. He doesn't take a deep breath. He just walks in there, sees what he's doing, and he's, I know exactly what I, what I got to do. Um, and, and so he, he grabs these pieces of rope, and he's making a whip. Now, before you start, you start thinking of Jesus here like your dad. You remember when your dad, back, back in the olden days, when your dad would come home, and you did something, and he just walked in and undid his belt and just pulled it out, and you just knew run because it, something bad was about to happen? That's, that's not, that's, I, I don't want you to have that picture of, of Jesus. See, the whip was an instrument that Jesus had to use to get the animals out, and I'm sure the, owner, the owners of those animals were going to quickly follow. And you have to understand the picture here. This, is, this, is, it, this wasn't like Jesus walking out there into the rotunda where there was a few, few people gathered around. I mean, this is, this is in the temple, and there's going to be thousands of people in this area. And Jerusalem is, is packed. There's millions of people in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So he had to do something in order to get to, to kind of make a scene to, to get some attention. Um, and, and so what he did was he began to dry those out. And one com- I love the way this one commentary wrote. He said, the whip is a representation of how serious this is and that something had to happen now. It had to happen now. He wasn't going, Jesus wasn't going to pray about this. He wasn't going to go talk to the owners of the animals or the money changers. He wasn't going to call a meeting of the temple leaders and say, hey, what's something that we can do here differently? How how can we do a win-win here? No, he wasn't going to do any of that. It was bad. It was wrong. It was a distraction. And it didn't belong. And something had to happen now. And he not only goes after the animals, but, but he, you know, he's going after the money changers too. And he was getting rid of everything that was an offense to God in his temple. This, this is in your outline. Jesus was angry, and his anger is directed towards attitudes and actions that have no place in his father's house. His anger was directed towards attitudes and actions that have no place in his father's house. Uh, We read it there in in John chapter 2 that his disciples, his reaction, his his zeal, the the anger that he felt, they they immediately recalled a a passage in their scripture from Psalm, zeal for your house will consume me. I love that word, consume. And you want to know what consumes Jesus? What consumes him is his Father's will. What consumes him is people knowing his father. What consumes him is anger, righteous anger, right anger towards anything or anyone that would hinder the worship of his father. Jesus is consumed with me and with you knowing his father in an intimate way. It consumed him so much that he went to the cross to die for our sins so that we could receive forgiveness and be restored to a right relationship with God. The selling of the animals, the money changers, uh, that stuff, it didn't belong. And I, I wonder today, what does God see when he looks at us? Now remember, as, as followers of Christ, we are called, I mean, we are all this, whether you, whether you realize it or not, or whether you believe it or not, we're all called, we're called the temple of God. So what does he see in us that really has no place? What does he see that is robbing our passion for him? Now, this morning I want to give you three quick things, and this list could go longer, but we don't have time for that. So these are just some things that I want to help for us to get the discussion started. And the first one is this, is there is no place uh, for business as usual. 
There is no place for, for business as usual because Jesus, he's confrontational. Jesus is confrontational. We like to think of Jesus as loving and, and kind and compassionate and caring and gentle. That's what we see in a lot of pictures, right, of Jesus sometimes. When, and, and he is all of those things, but he's not just all of those things. Jesus, he's confrontational. He wants to shake up our lives and call us to something greater. He's not here to make us happy and to make sure that all things go our way. Happiness really isn't his chief goal, but holiness is. Holiness is. And we find our greatest joy in Christ. Jesus saw what was wrong in the temple, and he did what was necessary to get it out. We can't get lulled into this this attitude of just business as usual. We can't stop it's, it's real easy for us to stop noticing sin in our lives. Why? Because we get numb to it. Or we start to rationalize it. Or, or we start listening to, to culture or other voices in, in, in our lives that just say, you know what, that's, that's really not that big of a deal. And so we just keep doing what we're doing. And if things go my way, I'm good. But Jesus didn't come so that things would go your way or my way. He came so that you can have life abundant life and that means he's going to shake things up when he sees something that doesn't belong when he sees something that's distracting for us he's going to confront us in that Matthew 23 1 through 4 says then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples the scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses therefore do whatever they tell you and observe it but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. Okay, so you talk about confrontational. You know who's, it says there that he spoke to the crowds and his disciples. You know who was in those crowds? Scribes and Pharisees. He's calling them out. What What do you think it was like for them when he says, don't be like them, and everyone turns around and looks at them? But it, this, it, and it's, it's crazy because it, it also, it, it kind of shocking to the, other, to the rest of the people because when you think of gold, the gold standard of religious people, you think of the one who does it right, who you thought was perfect, who you thought did it, it was, it was the Pharisees. So this shakes up their world too because God says, listen, you do what they say, but most definitely, most definitely don't do what they do. Uh, Luke 5, 29 through 32, it says, Levi made a great feast in his house. Levi was a tax collector who just decided to follow Jesus, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples. There they are again, Pharisees and scribes. Okay, they don't like him. Um, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well who have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here he goes again. Jesus, you're not, they're telling him, you're not supposed to be with these guys. And Jesus says, these are the people that need me. These are the people that need me. And if you weren't so blinded by your religion, if you weren't blinded by your just business as usual, you'd know, you'd know that you need me too. Matthew 5, 27 through 30 says, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now this is, this is a great example of Jesus getting in the face of business as usual. You've heard it said Okay, Jesus is saying, business as usual, you've heard it said, but I say, I'm taking it to the next level. Sin, it's bigger than just the act, it it goes to the heart. And just in case you weren't sure about how serious to take sin, Jesus says it's better for you to cut off your hand than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, obviously, 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 Jesus is using hyperbole here, but he's telling his audience and he's telling us, don't get stuck in the old way of thinking. In the old way of living, we need to see things through the eyes of Christ. I spent uh, my first 18 years in, in ministry, I spent it as, as a youth minister, in doing student ministry. 
And I loved it, and, and I still love it. I, I have a, a passion for students and student ministry, and, and as a student minister, you get to do a lot of great things. You're a part of a lot of incredible stuff, and, and a great student ministry is so important to a great church. Uh, but also in student ministry, you get, to do, you get to do a lot of good stuff, but you get to do a lot of not-so-good stuff, too. And one of those things was, was at youth camp when you, you would go into, you would go, or I would go into a guy's dorm and just do a room check. Now, I don't know what it was like in, in the girls' dorm. That wasn't my territory, but my territory was the guys' dorms. And sometimes you, you would walk in, you would open the door, you, you know, open the door, and then just immediately your eyes would begin to water um, because there was this most vile smell that was emanating from the room. I mean, you haven't even walked in yet. It's just, it just hits you because the door's open. And I mean, it's, it's like a combination of, of sweat and B.O. and stinky feet and, and gas and, and, and maybe a dead animal or two. I don't know what was in there. But it was so bad, and you just assume that when you walk into that room that you're going to find the boys just passed out because they just succumbed to the smell. But you walk in there, and they're just sitting on their beds, minding their own business, you know, sometimes eating. And, 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 and I, I would look at them, and I would say, what in the world happened in here? And you know what their reaction to me was every time, all the time? It didn't matter if it was a seventh grader or a senior. You know what their reaction was? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> they, they had lost, they, they had gotten so used to the smell. They, they didn't notice it anymore. They'd just grown used to it. They lived in it all week, and it no longer affects them. And I want to tell you something this morning, and this may offend you, but some of us in here, we stink spiritually. But we've gotten so used to our smell, we don't even notice it anymore. Why? Because it's just business as usual. We've grown used to it. But God, through his word, he wants, he wants to tell us that things aren't right. This doesn't belong in your life, and it needs to get out. He's not about business as usual. Jesus, he's confrontational. The second thing I would say is that there's no place for convenience and comfort. There's no place for convenience. Jesus calls us to die to ourselves. A part of bringing a sacrifice to God was that you were bringing something that belonged to you. You were bringing your best. And oftentimes, the animals that, that were that were brought were animals that, and, and when we're talking about Passover, the animals that were brought by families, these, these were animals that the family had invested in, that they had raised, that they had taken great care of. And probably, I mean, you guys have animals, you have pets, you, you, you grow a bond with these animals. The animals, they had significance to the family. So bringing that animal to the altar of God meant you were bringing something that you loved, something that you cared for, something that you valued, and you were laying it at the altar of God. And basically what you were saying was, God, I value you more than I value anything else. God, I love you more. But you see, buying a sacrifice, buying one there, it cost money, but there was no personal investment in that animal. Your blood, sweat, and tears, they weren't with that animal. You didn't have to think about what you were doing. You were just showing up, buying an animal, and then giving it over. That's, that's not sacrifice. That's convenience. I'm going to do as little as possible because I care way more about my comfort and things being easy. We're, we're creatures of convenience. I, I know I am. I want it easy. I want it fast. I, and most importantly, I, I want it the way that I want it. In Luke 9, 23, it says, And then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Now, if you've grown up in church or, you, or grown up reading the Bible, you've probably heard that verse a thousand times. But the danger of familiarity is that it can lose its power and significance to us. The cross wasn't jewelry and it wasn't fashion for the people who heard Jesus say this. The cross, it literally meant death. And people had seen, the, these people that were hearing this had seen people be crucified. They'd walked by people who were dying on crosses. So they hear this in the way that we need to hear this too as well. They hear this and they immediately thought he's asking us to die to something. He's asking us to die to ourselves, die to our agenda, die to our control, die to our wants and our desires. And guess what? When they heard that, when they heard Jesus say that, I can guarantee you that comfort and convenience were not the two words that immediately came to their mind. You see, because Jesus saw that in the temple and he wanted it out. And he sees it in us. And he wants it out. 
Galatians 5.24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified, there's the word again, the flesh with its passions and desires. Think, die to self, because that's what, who heard those words, Paul speak those words, that's what they're thinking. Romans 6, 12 through 13, it says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires, and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. You see, sin is, sin is bad. But I want to say something else here. Sin is also easy. It's so easy to live for the flesh, to live for ourselves. It's so easy to offer yourself to the things of this world. It's easy to, to let this, rule, this world start to rule your life. And so why do you think Jesus used such strong language? He said to die to those things, to, to make sure those things no longer have life in you. Die to those thoughts, and it's a daily death. Die to those thoughts. Why? Because Not just because sin is bad, but because sin, it's, it's not what's best. Jesus is what is right. Jesus is what is best. And if you're not willing to die to comfort and convenience, then there's no way for you to exercise your faith. When we take steps of faith, that's when we see, that's when God shows up. Comfort and convenience, that doesn't make you strong. It just makes you lazy. It makes you fearful to step out. And it makes you selfish and self-absorbed. Sacrifice costs, but it also changes you. Sacrifice costs you, but it also changes you. It causes you to become more like Christ. And the last thing I would tell you there is that there's no room for empty worship. Jesus wants your relationship. He doesn't want your religion. You know what's dangerous for, for a follower of Christ? It's when worship becomes routine. Jesus looked at the situation when he walked into the temple and he said, this is, this is just all rote. This is not about worship. You guys have completely lost the meaning and the reason for what all of this is all about, for this, this whole place. This whole place is a place to worship God and it stopped being that. And it's easy to fall into the trap of routine. It's easy to lose focus. Some of you um, may know the, actually may know the story around the song that we just sang before the sermon. I'm actually going to ask Jeff to go ahead and come up now. Uh, it's called The Heart of Worship. And, and the song was written by Matt Redman. And, and the, the church in the UK where he was leading worship had decided to go through a season of just using their voices and the scripture. The pastor, he... he had grown this, this sense that the congregation had grown too accustomed to the music, the musicians, the lights, the sound system, and felt like that, that had become the main thing instead of God being the main thing. So it was, it was during that season that Matt Redman uh, wrote that song. And he really wasn't thinking that it would become this big, huge congregational song that churches all over the world would sing. But it was such an amazing song that, that because it speaks directly to what we're talking about here. We must make sure that we're not, we're not losing sight of what God wants. He wants us. He doesn't want our song. He doesn't want our sacrifices. He doesn't want our religion. He wants us. He wants our relationship with him. And then those songs, what those songs do is those songs come from an overflow of what's in our hearts. Matthew 15 says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. And in Mark 7, this is actually listed wrong in your bulletin, but it's Mark 7, 14 through 15. It says, after he called the people to him again, he began to say to them, listen carefully to me, all of you, hear and understand what I'm saying. There is nothing outside of a man such as food which is going to, to, to defile him morally or spiritually, but it's the things which come from the heart of a man that defile him. In Hosea 6, 6, and this is through the message uh, uh, version, it says, I'm after love that lasts, not more religion. I want you to know God and not go to more prayer meetings. You see, it's the heart. And when it becomes routine, I think God would look at you and he would look at me and he would just, just kind of just say to us, don't bother. I know where that's coming from. That's coming from habit. That's not coming from your heart. Don't bother. You see, God's favorite song is the heart of someone who is passionate about him. A heart that's consumed with love for Jesus and is willing to die to self so that we can follow him. That's the worship that God wants. That's the type of worship that grabs his attention. Anything else, 
He doesn't want it. So the question that I close with today is the question that you see listed there in your bulletin. It says, what are the attitudes and actions that have no place in the life God has given you? Now, if you notice underneath that, there's a place for you to write an answer. And that's exactly what I want you to do. I want to challenge you right now. And the reason why he's up here is because he's just going just gonna to play for a little bit. And I want to give you a few seconds to pray about, to think about, but then to literally write what it is in my life that if Jesus walked into his temple right now, what would he see and that he would immediately want to drive out? That's my challenge. Don't save it for later. Do it now. Take just a few minutes and write what God is saying. This needs to be gone from your life. Here's what I want you to do with that. One of the things that we need in life is we need each other and we need accountability. And so what, if you're brave enough, what I would like for you to do today is share that with someone. What you wrote, what you wrote, what you said that needs to be, that this just needs, this is in me and it needs to get out. So that that person can, can pray with you, that person can encourage you, and that person can keep you accountable. Because here's the deal, in, in, in reality, there is something that all of us could have written in that blank. All of us. So I challenge you to, to share that with someone. It might be your spouse. Uh, it might be your parents. It might be a brother or sister. It might be a friend. It might be a coworker. Uh, it, but another believer who, can, who loves you and can help you and keep you accountable in those things. I know that's scary, but here's the deal. We've got to be willing to be vulnerable. Because when we're vulnerable, then what happens is we let people in our lives and people that we trust, and we can be encouraged. So if you didn't write something down just now, I, I want you to do it, and then I want you to, if possible, share, some, share it with someone. And, and it's funny, in verse 18, after Jesus does all of this stuff, the, the, the leaders look at him and say, by what, if, you know, what, what, what sign will you show us for doing these things? So basically what they were saying is, by what authority do you have to come in here and do what you just did? And Jesus' response is great. They don't get it. But he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. What Jesus was referring to was himself. By what authority does he come in to, to clean his father's house out? The authority is, is that he is God. He is God's son. And that he is the creator of all things. And so it is only right and it is only proper. It, it, and it, 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 it is what we should be doing. We should submit to his authority and say, God, this is your temple. Come in here and clean house. Come in here and clean house. And I don't know what that is for you today. For some of you, that might be you want to give your life over to Jesus. As This is your first time. You have never given my life. as I've never had a relationship with him. And I want to start that. For some of you, it might be some confession that you need to make to someone um, and, and just to say, there's some things I got to get out in the open, there's some things I just we just need to talk about. It may be with, with husbands with wives and wives with husbands. It may be kids with parents and parents with kids. It may be friendships. There's something where you would say, this has been in me and it needs to get out and we, I, need, I need this to be God's house and I need to get rid of it. For some of you, it might be to, to finally do a public expression of, of what Jesus did in your life. This, right after this service, we're doing an outdoor baptism where people are, are, are sharing with the world. They're saying, I love Jesus and I want to do what he's asked me to do and he's asked me to be baptized because that's, that's a public expression of what's happened in my life. I'm, no, I'm dying to my old self. 
I'm buried with Christ, but because of Christ, I'm alive and I'm made new. So if you'd like to be back, maybe you didn't come ready for that today, but we've got, we've got shirts, we've got clothes we can help you with. And if you would like to be baptized today, right now, right after this service, then our pastor, Chad, he's, he's, gonna be, he's right back there at the back. And so in a minute, when we stand and start singing, what I'm going to ask you to do is just go right straight back to him, and he'll take you, and he'll get you ready. But whatever the decision is that you need to make, I pray that, that you would do that. Because what this temple needs to be about, this, our worship needs to be about is, is the Father and our relationship with Him. And we're not going to bring Him all the junk. What we need to bring Him is we need to bring Him us because that's what He wants, a heart that belongs to Him.